Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. The time for this debate has expired. We'll move to question time, and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, did Mr Albanese promise to cut the energy bills for Australians by saying, and I quote, our plan will cut family power bills by $275 a year by 2025? Um, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Birmingham for uh, his, uh, his question. Um, it is a little bit rich after years and years and years and years of failing, of failing, of failing to do, of failing to uh, do anything about energy prices, or failing to do anything about a plan to deal with issues related to climate change. Uh, that the opposition should be asking this question. Um, what, was, what was the first thing that, or one of the first things, that um, Prime Minister Albanese did on coming to office? He realised, realised, he realised, he realised the inaction of the opposition on, on this issue of electricity prices, and he took action, and he took action. He took, he took action in a way which. As Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Order on the question of mm -hmm. direct relevance by the minister. It was a very narrow question, asking specifically to confirm or not whether or not the prime minister made a particular statement about cutting electricity bills by $275 a year. Thank so you. yes or no answer, minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will direct um, the senator to the. Uh, body of your question, Minister thank you, Farrell. Uh, uh, thank you, um, President, and thank you for that uh, clarification by uh, <coughs> um, the uh, leader uh, <coughs> on the uh, on the question. Um, look, you can't you can't answer that question in the way in which the opposition would like it answered. You can only answer that question. You can uh, only Minister, that question. Minister, just a moment, Senator Birmingham, Minister Farrell, Senator Birmingham. President, a further point of order in relation to, to relevance. The minister is now claiming that he can't answer a question as to whether or not the now Prime Minister said something or didn't something. Well, I seek leave, President, to table the speech by the Prime Minister to the NFF 2022 National Conference in which he said uh, our plan Senator will cut Birmingham, family power Senator bills by $275 a year, one of the 97 occasions on which Thank he made you. such a statement. Thank you. Sleep uh, Senator Birmingham, I will I check to see if leave is granted. Is leave granted? Customarily, uh, President, uh, an opportunity is given to um, the uh, other side to uh, look at the document. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to uh, examine the document closely and uh, uh, advise uh, um, thank you. the leader. Uh, Thank you. So, Senator Birmingham, I understand the government will come back to you. I will again remind the um, minister of your question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, uh, um, President. Um, <clears throat> look, the point I was making was was a simple one. Uh, you cannot you cannot answer um, in a simple way the question that you're seeking an answer to without explaining the lack of action. Uh, by the previous government on, on electricity prices, we came in. We came in um, to government, um, <clears throat> finding all of these areas where there's been uh, uh, neglect, and we've set about one by one um, seeking to uh, fix. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Is it still the Albanese Labor government's policy that Australians will see their power bills fall by $275 a year by 2025, as stated by Prime Minister Albanese on no fewer than 97 occasions prior to the election? Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, it's still. It's still the uh, wish and the desire of the Albanese government to ensure that we do everything as a government to put downward pressure on electricity prices for 
ordinary Australians um, in terms of their household bills uh, and um, companies um, who operate now in an environment uh, where um, there's upward pressure on um, electricity bills. We're about putting downward pressure on those, on those bills, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. Why did we cap? Why did we cap? Why did this government cap um, uh, um, uh, gas bills, um, Madam President? Why did we cap? Um, 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 why did we cap um, coal coal prices? We capped them to put that downward pressure on on those bills. And, and to your everlasting disgrace, Thank you, you Minister, opposed that it. time for you answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. <laughs> President, will the minister admit that the Albanese Labor government has abandoned its promise to cut power bills by $275 a year by 2020-25, and that, in fact, on the 97-plus occasions it promised that prior to the last election, it was simply seeking to deceive the Australian people, deliberately so, before Order. they got the chance to vote. Order. I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence. Order on my left and my right. Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank you, President. Well, well, what a cheek. What a cheek. Asking the question about deceiving, deceiving the Australian people. Who, 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 who replaced you? Who replaced you as finance minister? It was Scott Morrison. But, but did he tell you? Did he tell you? Did he tell you? He didn't. He didn't even tell you that he replaced you as finance minister. Um, minister Farrell. Minister Farrell. Just a moment, Senator Birmingham. There needs to be order. Senator Birmingham. The direct part of relevance there. You couldn't be more irrelevant or more hopeless or uh, more unable to Senator answer the question Birmingham. or less willing to talk Senator about $275 than Senator Farrell Senator is. Birmingham, resume your seat. Order. Order. It is the custom in this chamber to allow leaders some leeway, but seriously, points of order need to be made directly. Minister Farrell, I remind you of, the, of Senator Birmingham's question. Please continue. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, President. And uh, I, I can assure the opposition, and I can assure the Australian people, and I can assure businesses in Australia that this government, they, they, they us, this government, this government, this government, this government is serious about putting downward, putting downward pressure on electricity prices. That's why we've taken. The hard decisions. That's why we've taken the hard decisions. Contrary to uh, a lot of interested uh, groups in this country, uh, thank we've you, taken. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart. Thank you. Um, I'm smiling because it's like those opposite don't own a mirror when they're talking about lies and deceit. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the minister for climate change and energy, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the government's proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism? Will ensure Australia meets, it, meets its legislated emissions reduction target. Great thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Stewart uh, for the question on this um, a really important question, particularly on the day when we've got the latest IPCC report. Right now, the Parliament has an opportunity to get Australia's biggest emitters to reduce their emissions. Right. The safeguard mechanism reform is key to meeting our legislated emissions reductions target which is something that this chamber uh, supported late last year, a 43 per cent uh, reduction target. The Liberal National Government wasted a decade with inaction on climate change. We all know that. But this reform will give the market and heavy industry the certainty that they have been seeking and asking for for some time. It will drive change amongst the 215 biggest emitters in the country, who represent 28 per cent of our overall emissions. It will take, if it's passed, 205 million tonnes of carbon out of the air by 2030. Wow. That's the equivalent of taking two-thirds of the cars off Australian roads. As former Energy Security Board Chair and current Chair of the Carbon Market Institute, Kerry Schott, has said about these reforms, it will drive decarbonisation in Australia's highest polluting industrial facilities. She explained that it is designed to benefit the companies already doing a lot 
while allowing others to catch up without a prohibitive upfront expense. The reform has strong and broad-based support across the economy and community. We are in good faith negotiations with those senators who are engaged, none of those opposite, of course, who have dealt themselves out of any discussion. And I support the comments made by Senator Lambie this morning on ABC Radio National when she said we could have a starting point through, the, through in early 2011 and 2012. We missed that opportunity. This is a great opportunity. Let's pounce on it. At the last election, the Australian people clearly voted for change. They wanted to end Thank the climate Minister, wars, the and we've got the chance to do expired. that. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Could the minister update the Senate on the findings of the latest IPCC synthesis report and how this underscores the need for the parliament to support the government's proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Stewart, for the supplementary. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest synthesis report makes clear there is a rapidly closing window for action and economic transition. Simply put, action is needed right now. We are starting well behind where we should. After a decade of the denial, delay, dysfunction from those opposite, they had 22 failed energy policies and couldn't land one of them, including um, the safeguard mechanism now, which they seemingly oppose. We have not wasted a single day since coming to office. The IPCC synthesis report highlights the need for action. To keep one and a half degrees within reach, we have to act fast. The safeguard reforms could start to take effect on July 1, just over 100 days away. So it's, it's action that's needed now that will determine the future of our planet, and I would urge senators to support the safeguard mechanism yeah. bill when it comes to this chamber later this week. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can Minister Gallagher update the Senate on what opportunities are presented by the Albanese government's plans and what the potential costs of squandering those opportunities would be? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Stewart for the supplementary. The Albanese government has worked constructively with biz businesses to formulate a plan that will end the policy uncertainty and enable a predictable emissions reduction pathway to net zero by 2050. The safeguard mechanism reforms are the next step in supporting Australia's biggest emitters remain competitive in a decarbonising global economy whilst reducing their emissions. These reforms, importantly, are supported by the Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who have, have publicly supported uh, this uh, approach through the, the reforms to the safeguard mechanism. We cannot squander this opportunity that we can to get moving to cover the 215 facilities covered by the mechanism. Many of them already have uh, signed up to net zero by 2050. We don't want to end, back, end up where we were years ago under this mob, where we had uh, lack or Thank total lack of action on climate expired. change. Senator Cash, first, uh, primary, first question. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Uh, Minister, your government's submission to the Fair Work Commission last year recommended that the Fair Work Commission ensures real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards. Will your government's submission this year still include this recommendation? Minister Farrell. Deliberate design feature. Order. I've called the minister. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator um, Cash for uh, for her question. Um, so you've correctly uh, identified what uh, um, uh, the submission that we put to the um, Fair Work Commission um, last year, and uh, of course we will. Uh, prepare uh, an appropriate response to um, the next um, national uh, national wage case. I think um, it's important to um, realise that under your government, um, of course, uh, low wages were um, a design feature of right. your your economic uh, overall economic uh, strategy. And when we went to the election, we said we were going to um, turn things around and start putting upward pressure on um, uh, wages so that ordinary working Australians who uh, work very hard for their living got an appropriate um, recompense uh, for 
um, their labour. Uh, and that's what we did. And of course, within weeks, I think it might have been, of uh, coming, to, um, coming to power last year, of course, there was a national wage uh, uh, case. My uh, <coughs> recollection was that we um, proposed a 5.1 per cent uh, increase. And of course, the Commission, um, in a structured sort of way, started out at uh, 5.2 per cent. So, um, I think, in term, you know, if the Australian people think about the difference between the two uh, governments um, and what we've done in terms of putting uh, upward pressure on wages to try and give people a chance to deal with the issue of rising prices, uh, then, uh, of course, we have delivered for the Australian people. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering is expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you, President. In May last year, Mr Albanese was asked if he supported a pay rise of 5.1 per cent, the rate of inflation at the time. He replied, absolutely. Further adding, we think no one should go backwards. Inflation is now at 7.4 per cent. Is it still the government's policy that wages shouldn't go backwards? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Farrell. Well, of course it's, it's our policy. Of course, of course, if that's uh, our policy that uh, wages uh, not, uh, not go backwards, and we've, we've delivered on, uh, on this. Um, in the first national wage case that uh, came before uh, uh, the Fair Work Commission after we came to, uh, to government, of course, we um, put a submission to um, the, uh, the Fair Work Commission on that, uh, on that very point. And, of course, as I said in my previous answer, that was in stark contrast to um, <coughs> Uh, your uh, position in, in, uh, in government, where a design feature of your economic policy was to keep downward pressure on, on wages. Um, there is a new national wage case. Of course, um, we are preparing the <coughs> minister. We've got an excellent minister, Minister Burke, uh, in, this, uh, in this portfolio area. He's in the process of preparing his submissions. Thank you, and Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you. And given the Minister has confirmed that it is the government's policy that no one should go backwards, I again ask the Minister, will your government's submission to the Fair Work Commission recommend the Fair Work Commission ensures real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards, consistent with your policy? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, everything, everything, uh, Senator Cash, that this government does is all about uh, trying to uh, assist, uh, particularly low-paid um, workers, but workers generally, um, deal with the economic mess that your that your government left us to fix. I mean. <coughs> I mean, all of these problems, all of these problems Order. like Order. Uh, inflation, were all problems that uh, developed and uh, became problems under your your government. You failed to do you failed you failed Order. to do anything about it. You failed to um, uh, support Australian workers getting uh, wage rises. We've got the runs. We've got we've got the runs on the board, Senator Cash. We've delivered. We, we delivered. We delivered in the first few weeks. The first few weeks of Thank coming you, to government. The time we for delivered. Answering has expired. Order, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watt, representing Minister Giles. Today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. It's observed throughout the world on the day police in South Africa killed 69 people at a peaceful protest against apartheid in 1960. But only in Australia is 21st March celebrated as Harmony Day with barely a mention of racism. Harmony Day is a Howard government invention that whitewashes racism and sweeps it under the rug. We know that in Australia too many people feel the sear of racism every single day. The, on the weekend, Melbourne saw the despicable alliance of hate with neo-Nazis saluting on the steps of Victorian Parliament. Will the government ditch Harmony Day and Harmony Week and restore the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination with its original purpose of recognising the pervasive nature of racism and combating it. 
Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, you are indeed correct uh, that today is the International Day of, uh, for the Elimination of Racial, racial Discrimination. And as you say, uh, this uh, recognises uh, both the tragic events that occurred in South Africa all those years ago, uh, but it also marks 75 years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and focuses on the urgent need to combat racism and racial discrimination. Uh, and the reason I'm aware of that is that I'm reading directly from the tweet that Minister Giles, the Immigration Minister and Multiculturalism Minister, has put up today in recognition of this important event. Uh, so, to the extent that um, your question suggests that our government does not adequately recognise the importance of this day, then I have to reject that. Uh, and, and, you know, the minister himself has made public uh, the fact that this is an important day uh, for us to remember um, the importance of eliminating racial discrimination. Uh, he's gone on to make the point that the Albanese Labor government has invested $7.5 million to the Australian Human Rights Commission in order to develop a national anti-racism strategy to tackle racism and promote racial equality in Australia. And of course, he makes the point, which I would hope that everyone in this chamber shares, that no matter where you were born, the language you speak or the faith you practice, the Albanese government is committed to a multicultural Australia where everyone belongs. So I don't think there can be any doubt where this government stands uh, on these issues or, or the minister himself. Uh, I think there can be some doubt about the level of commitment uh, across the political spectrum to eliminating racial discrimination because I, like you, Senator Faruqi, was highly disturbed uh, to see the neo-Nazi demonstration outside the Victorian Parliament and the fact that it included a serving Liberal Party member of the Victorian State Parliament. And I think there are some serious questions uh, for the Victorian Liberal Party and indeed Mr Dutton as to where his Thank party you, lines Minister, up on these issues. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, last week was the fourth anniversary of the Christchurch Mosque massacre, where 51 Muslims were killed by an Australian white supremacist driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. This morning, the fourth Islamophobia report in Australia was launched, and it shows hatred towards Muslims in Australia remains high, with women and children bearing the brunt of this on the front line. What will the government commit to today to obliterate Islamophobia in Australia? Yeah. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi. Well, as I, as I said in my answer to the primary question, we have already made a commitment uh, that backs up our position on the need to eliminate racial discrimination. As I've said, we have committed $7.5 million to the Australian Human Rights Commission to develop a national anti-racism strategy uh, to tackle racism and promote racial equality in Australia, and we've commenced work on our election commitment of deliver delivering a multicultural framework review. Uh, I noticed, Senator Faruqi, that your primary question uh, asked uh, when the government intends to eliminate uh, a Harmony Day or words to that effect. I guess that might be a question you might also like to put to Mr Bant, uh, who in March last year hopped on Facebook to say, fantastic to be at Carlton Harmony Day at Carlton Primary School with Ellen Sandell today, celebrating just what makes Melbourne so brilliant. So maybe we've all got a little bit to think about on this International Day of needing uh, to eliminate racial discrimination. Once again, the Greens like to tell people what to do, not so Thank good you, at doing Minister. it themselves. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, the climate crisis is a racial justice issue. Those who contributed least to the crisis, black and brown people in the Global South, are and will experience the worst of it. The IPCC report today makes clear that a livable future means no new fossil fuels. Will the government finally listen to science and rule out new coal and gas? Uh, thank you, President. Well, I think we're sort of jumping portfolios here, but, um, but I, I, I do agree that uh, it is people living in the developing world who are most at risk of the effects of climate change. Uh, that is self-evident, uh, and, and it is an important reminder why all of us in this chamber should get behind initiatives uh, to do something serious about climate change. And you know what? I've got an idea. It's called the safeguards mechanism. Perhaps that might be the kind of thing that the Greens might choose to back in as a means Order. of trying to reduce emissions uh, and, and reduce the impacts on climate change, whether they be here or in developing countries. This, this fortnight, 
this parliament, this chamber, is going to have the opportunity to actually do something about tackling climate change, not just performing, not just doing stunts, not just doing memes for social media, but actually doing something concrete to tackle the impact of climate change in developing countries. So, Senator Faruqi, I look forward to your support when it comes to a vote for that, to have an opportunity to actually do something real. Thank you, Minister Watt. The time has expired. Senator Stirl. First question. Thank you, President. While the Minister is on a roll, uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. The Albanese Government's National Reconstruction Fund promises to be a landmark policy that will transform Australian industry and revitalise our manufacturing sector. How will the NRF benefit Australian agriculture, Minister? Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl, who is known throughout this chamber and throughout this parliament as a strong supporter of Australian agriculture, uh, including as the uh, fabulous chair of the, of the RAT committee, um, and it, where he does a terrific job. Um, the, uh, <laughs> good to see he's not lacking in confidence in that respect. Uh, the Albanese La Labor government wants Australia to be a country that makes things again. What a revolutionary idea that is, uh, to be a country that makes things again. After more than 10 years of our manufacturing industry being run down by a Liberal and National Party government that literally dared our car industry to leave this country. Shame. We want a country that supports Australian manufacturing and the development of our sovereign capabilities. We don't ever want to be in the same situation that Australia was in through COVID, where all of a sudden we didn't have the capacity to make ventilators, to make PPE, uh, to make all the other things, the rat tests, um, all the other things that we were caught short on. And that's why we need to be able to stand at our own two feet and have greater sovereign capability. And that, that's exactly what the Albanese government's National Reconstruction Fund is all about. The National Reconstruction Fund is about transforming the Australian economy. It's a $15 billion investment in securing our future prosperity, adding value to our natural resources and bolstering critical supply chains. The National Reconstruction Fund will provide finance to drive investments in seven priority areas of the Australian economy. And pleasingly, one of those areas is via a $500 million sub-fund for value-adding in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. This fund will unlock potential and value add to raw materials in sectors like food processing, textiles, clothing and footwear manufacturing. Importantly, it would also invest in agricultural supply chain products, such as fertiliser, which would help drive down input costs for farmers right around the country. And I can tell you over the last few weeks I've been meeting with quite a lot of farmers' organisations, telling them about the National Reconstruction Fund and how it can help with fertiliser costs and everything else, and they all think this Thank is you, something Minister we should Wall, all get behind. The time for behind. answering has expired. Senator Stirl, first supplementary. Thank you, President. The National Reconstruction Fund will invest at least $500 million in value-adding in the agriculture, forestry and fishery Order. sector. Please continue, Senator. We know, we know that these sectors generate economic activity and jobs in regional Australia, Minister. So how will the NRF support businesses and create manufacturing jobs in regional Australia? Uh, before I call the Minister, I remind Senators that interjections across the Chamber are very disorderly. Uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl. Well, the National Reconstruction Fund is about creating jobs, secure jobs, well-paid jobs, blue-collar jobs, jobs in our regions. And a number of the NRF priority areas have a strong regional presence, sectors such as resources, agriculture, defence and renewables. In fact, one third of manufacturing jobs in our country are located outside our capital cities, and that's exactly why we should get behind the National Reconstruction Fund, and that's exactly why any party that claims to represent regional Australia should be backing in the National Reconstruction Fund as well. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Let's just have a look at what some of the stakeholders who actually care about regional Australia have to say. The NFF president, Fiona Simpson, when this was announced, I am heartened by Mr Albanese's support for the NFF's call for a renaissance of regional manufacturing. Labor's announcement is a step in the right direction. Geelong Manufacturing Council, Senator Henderson, you might be interested in this. We strongly congratulate the government for a focus and emphasis on regional development in the National Reconstruction Fund Thank consultation. You, Get on board, back our region. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. <laughs> order. Order. <laughs> Senator Henderson. Order. 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 Senator Ayres. I have the Senator on his feet. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Thank you, President. 
President, I can't even hear myself. Um, just resume your seat, yeah. Senator Stills. I've just reminded senators that interjections across the chamber are disorderly, and I expect you to cease. Senator Still, please continue. The protection, President. It is clear to me that it is, the vit it is vital that the National Reconstruction Fund passes this parliament to support economic growth and secure jobs in our regions. So, Minister, are there any risks to these reforms passing the parliament? Minister Watt. Well, Senator Stirl, I'm very sorry to inform you that there are some risks to part of these reforms passing the parliament. Unfortunately, not everyone is on board with backing our regions and with the Albanese government's plan to transform Australian manufacturing and back good blue-collar jobs. Now, the opposition had the choice to say yes to Australian manufacturing, but they've chosen to say no. They've chosen to say no to new jobs, no to new investment, no to new opportunities, especially in our regions. Whatever the issue, they just say no. It's like being caught in some never-ending loop of Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. That's what the opposition do under the leadership of Peter Dutton, and they're doing it again when it comes to the National Reconstruction Fund. We've been clear from the start. This is a fund which will revitalise Australian manufacturing and develop Australia's industrial capability. It was never about investing in coal, gas or native forestry, despite the Greens patting themselves on the back for getting a win that they didn't actually get. This is about rebuilding manufacturing in Australia. This is about good blue-collar jobs Thank and it's you, about time Minister the opposition the got behind it. Has expired. Senator David <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Murray Watt. Uh, is the government aware that Australians are being exposed to illegal advertisements on their social media feeds from online casinos? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Obviously, you didn't get the memo that all the questions were, going to, were supposed to go to Senator Farrell this week, uh, but uh, happy, to, happy to have an attempt at this. I have heard uh, the media reporting about this issue this morning. Uh, I'll attempt to get some more information on this point for you during question time, uh, but I do think that all Australians are concerned about the growing proliferation uh, of gambling advertising on online forms. There's, of course, particular concerns when it comes to the, the risk around those advertisements being accessed by children. Uh, I know, as a parent myself, I'm pretty disturbed about the amount of online advertising that goes on around gambling, which can clearly be accessed by children, if not being, in fact, targeted by children. Uh, and, of course, there are additional concerns about uh, the risk of online gambling advertisements to the adult population as well. Um, we, 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 this is something that needs a close exploration of to make sure that our regulatory systems are adequate for the task. Uh, and this is something that I know Minister Rowland takes very seriously. Uh, she has already commenced work uh, on, on a range of fronts when it comes to online uh, advertising, uh, particularly in relation to gambling, and that's something that our entire government supports, because we do want to make sure uh, that the regulatory settings that we have in place uh, for online advertising uh, are suitable. Uh, this is obviously a fast-evolving field. Uh, it's one of those areas where the minute that governments intervene uh, and create regulatory, a regulatory environment, new operators come on board and find loopholes, and it's something that we do always need to review. Um, I think more generally, when it comes to gambling advertising, I can assure you that the Albanese government recognises the importance of gambling promotions uh, being presented in a responsible manner. Uh, we also recognise that there is ongoing community concern about the harms associated with online gambling, including advertising material, and I think that it is timely for Parliament to consider what more should be done to address this issue. And Senator Pocock, I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, will the government commit to taking action to close these loopholes and ensure that the regulator, ACMA, does have the power to enforce them? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Um, thanks again, Senator Pocock. And, and as I say, the Albanese government does recognise ongoing community concern about harms associated with online gambling. Uh, and that's exactly why we have established an inquiry into online gambling and its impacts on those experiencing excuse me, gambling harm. That inquiry is being conducted uh, by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. And if I'm not mistaken, that's being chaired by Peter Murphy, uh, uh, one of our outstanding members in the, in the House of Representatives. And I've seen some of the media coverage that she's obtained in talking about this important issue. Uh, this committee is considering the effectiveness of current gambling advertising restrictions 
on limiting uh, children's exposure to gambling products and services, including through social media, sponsorship or branding, among a range of other issues. Uh, and you're asking Senator Pocock what the government intends to do about it. I guess the first step is to consider the committee's recommendations when it releases its final report, and I can assure you they Thank will you be Minister, properly considered. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Uh, once, once the committee reports back and, and you make those changes, will you commit to ensuring that ACMA can actually in, enforce them? At the moment, there's, there's a variety of areas where ACMA has no uh, jurisdiction, and it seems to me that's something that also needs to be updated. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, it would obviously um, be premature for me or anyone from the government to comment on what we will do in response to that inquiry and its recommendations. Uh, but, but I acknowledge the issues that you've raised about the jurisdiction of ACMA. Uh, and if that is something that the committee finds is something that needs uh, some changes made, then of course we would do that. Uh, Senator Pocock, I'm not sure what engagement you've had with that inquiry up until this point, but of course you, like every member of the public, are entitled to make a submission to that inquiry, and I'd certainly encourage you to do so if you haven't done so already, uh, because we do think that this is a really important issue. We want to hear from the broad range of the Australian public about how we can best address it. Uh, and as I say, should the inquiry recommend that we make the type of changes that you're talking about in relation to ACMA, uh, then I'm sure that we would uh, listen very closely to that. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, yesterday in question time, when asked if your government would scrap stage three tax cuts, you declared, and I quote, our policy on these tax cuts hasn't changed. Can you clarify for the Senate what exactly your policy is? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm very happy to. I've been saying that in this place uh, for some time. I think Senator McKim asked me virtually every sitting uh, uh, week uh, an answer about stage uh, three. Um, tax cuts. The fact is, stage three um, tax cuts has been legislated by this, this chamber. They are in place. Um, the stage three, I think, will commence in July next year. Um, the Labor, um, the policy we took to the election was that those um, tax cuts remain in place, and our position hasn't changed. Um, so that would, that is what I was saying yesterday. Um, that is, continues to be our position. I don't think it's a, a surprise to anyone. That's the position that we have had uh, for some time. And of course, um, I think the position that uh, Senator McKim raises with, with me on, on this issue is um, you know, related to the budget pressures that we have and how we're going to meet those pressures. And they are real. We have inherited a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. Uh, the debt had doubled before the pandemic. Um, we've got a lot of pressures coming our way. We had a lot of uh, time bombs or little booby traps built into the, the budget that we inherited, and we're working through all those. So there is enormous pressure on the budget, and that's the context with which I, I gave that answer yesterday. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, given you've stated numerous times that your government policy hasn't changed in relation to the stage three tax cuts, can you guarantee it won't be subject to change in the future? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Well, our policy on, them has, uh, on the tax cuts has not changed. Uh, that is the position that we are in. We have made it clear that our position in relation to taxation changes around multinational tax reform, which was um, put in place in the October budget, and the modest change that we've announced in relation to superannuation. Uh, but um, the, the issue more broadly around um, how we manage the budget is real. And I, I want people to understand that we inherited a budget in a um, complete— Minister, well, I've answered the question. And uh, Minister uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, on relevance to the question asked, uh, Madam President, I asked if it wouldn't be subject to change in the future. The minister, uh, in my first question, answered whether the policy had changed to the present. 
My question was about future changes to this particular uh, policy thank you, area. Senator McKenzie, uh, and the minister has answered the first part of your question, and you've just reminded her of the second part. So, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I did answer the question when I uh, answered uh, Senator McKenzie's supplementary, which is that our our position on tax cuts hasn't changed, but we are in the position of having to repair a budget that was vandalised by those opposite for a decade. Budget va vandals that have left a $50 billion structural deficit despite themselves uh, rorting and pork barrelling all around the country. Expired. Senator McKenzie, a second supplementary. Order. Thank no, when they're on the run, when they just go on the attack and refuse to answer the question. Absolutely. My second supplementary then, Minister, why won't your government demonstrate the same level of transparency it called for in opposition and actually rule out further changes to the stage three tax cuts? I'm going to wait for order before I call the minister. Order, minister. When I think, when I reflect, thank you, President, on ways to describe the Morrison government. <laughs> Transparency is not one of those issues that springs to mind as one of those first ways that you would describe it. I think there's a lot of words, there's a lot of adjectives that you would use, but transparency is not one of them. Uh, we, are, we are 10 minutes, Minister 10 Gallagher, months. Please sorry. Resume your seat. I'm going to wait for order again. Minister Gallagher. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Transparency is not um, one of those words. Anyway, we're 10 months in to cleaning up. No, integrity would not be the, another one. No, we could play what word rorts? bingo, what couldn't we? Rorts. 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 Minister Gallagher, Tip. please Tip resume your seat. Order. Order. Order on my right. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. I've got a senator on her feet. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. Again, it was relevancy to the question. You called for a level of transparency in opposition, and I'm asking you why you won't demonstrate uh, that level of transparency you. when in government. Thank you, yeah. Senator McKenzie. That was part of your uh, question, and you also referred to the previous government, and I believe that the minister is being, um, respond is being um, relevant. Senator McKenzie? Point of order. Just the question doesn't refer to the previous government uh, at all. Senator McKenzie, I, you said as we did, which does refer to the previous government. They did. Uh, thank you, Senator McKenzie. I believe the minister is being relevant. She has 21 seconds to go, Minister Gallagher. Yeah, the question was about why, why, uh, transparency, and we are being transparent. We're being very transparent with the budget mess that we inherited right. from those budget vandals opposite. A $50 billion structural deficit every year, pork barrelling all around the country, a trillion dollars of Liberal debt and not enough to show for it. That's the transparency, and we are being honest with the Australian Thank people you, Minister, about it. The time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. The August submarine deal appears to be creating division within government ranks. The Labor member for Fremantle was reported to have said, and I quote, while I support the work of the government, I'm not completely convinced that nuclear-propelled submarines are the only or best answer to our strategic needs. End quote. The Labor member for Higgins, after questioning the decision to buy submarines in the Labor Party room, later issued a statement saying, and I quote, I now fully support the government's announced AUKUS plan. End quote. Fully support, huh? This deal reportedly doesn't deliver a submarine to Australia for 10 years, and I'll tell you from where I'm saying that's going to be on a good day. What small this government doesn't start building submarines in Australia for two decades? Can the minister explain to Australia how we can trust the government on this purchase when some of its own backbenchers do not? Thank you, uh, Senator Lambie. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, for her, um, for her question, and I'll start my answer by sort of saying we, we're a democracy in the Labor Party, and uh, people, people, people can Order express, express, Order. express, uh, Order. Uh, express a point of view. Uh, and, uh, Minister Farrell, I, Minister Farrell, I would, please resume your seat. 
Order on my left. Order. Order. This is a question asked by Senator Lambie, and the disorder coming particularly from my left is making it impossible for me to hear the minister's answer. Minister, please continue. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Um, so, look, we, um, we've got uh, a history of democratic uh, thought in the, uh, in the Labor Party, and, uh, and people, people are always. Always, always been free. Always to been free to uh, express uh, a point of view. But I think, I think, I think the important uh, thing here is, uh, and I, uh, you know, the AUKUS, the AUKUS announcement last uh, week was obviously a great triumph. It was obviously a great triumph for uh, Prime Minister uh, Albanese, but a great triumph for our our country. Um, but look, there are um, lots of uh, lots of details about the AUKUS uh, decision, and uh, I'd encourage everybody to ask questions. Even the opposition, we haven't. I don't think we've had a single question in the last two days about the about about uh, about AUKUS. We haven't had a single question. So I give you credit. I give you credit, uh, um, Senator Lambie, for focusing on the issue. Um, but look, can I say? Can I say? I've um, got Minister complete Farrell, faith. Minister Farrell, please resume I've... your seat. Senator Hughes, thank you. Please continue. Thanks, President. And I know they're embarrassed that they haven't asked a question, and that it's it's now been Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie has had the courage to ask the questions. Now, can I say this? The Labor Party. The Labor Party is. 100 Thank you, Minister. The time for answering the Prime has Minister. expired. Order. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam President. Australian manufacturing was destroyed by the last government. During their, wait, during their government, we saw closures of manufacturing plants. They forced car manufacturers out. They slashed research and development. They locked apprentices out of work. Will the minister please explain how a deal that doesn't start building submarines for 20 years will help Australian manufacturing today? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Well, um, look, I agree with you, uh, Senator Lambie. It was a disgrace the way in which the former government yes. uh, uh, forced, forced Holden and then Toyota out of this uh, country. Uh, this government, this government, this government. Uh, is about is about order. building order order across the chamber order across the chamber order Senator Farrell uh, this government is about building things in Australia again and I take your point I take your point that um, the delay the ten years of delay the ten years of delay under the former government about uh, announcing when these submarines would uh, be built, Senator of course, Henderson. has uh, pushed back the date of uh, the um, construction of those uh, submarines. But can I say this? There's a whole lot of other aspects that um, you have to build before Senator you get to Henderson. building the submarines. And I'd be happy to host you down in uh, Osborne in South Australia to see some of the construction that's about to start. Well, I'd like to thank go you, there Minister. Too, but the time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I'll ask you to come to the state of Tasmania and I'll tell you why. In my state of Tasmania, we have apprentices learning their trade in TAFEs that are underfunded and under-resourced. This morning I heard from a young electrician apprentice in Tasmania. He's being taught his trade on 1950s equipment with, value, with valves from the Soviet Union. So when will this government make sure that our TAFEs have the equipment and resources required to adequately teach our kids to build submarines? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Well, well I, I, I will happily come down to Tasmania, as I just did uh, recently, to um, look at uh, some of your um, wonderful uh, tourism. Um, um, no, no, there's more than vineyards. There's more than vineyards down there. I went to a, a mushroom... Uh, um, production. I went to the wooden boats, uh, the wooden boats um, exhibition. But um, we we're about we're about creating Order. jobs in the areas that you've specifically mentioned, uh, um, Senator Lambie. And I, I'm pleased you're asking questions about manufacturing jobs because I haven't had 
I haven't. I haven't had a single question. I haven't had a single question from the co the uh, the uh, coalition on this uh, on this issue. Uh, but we are all about creating jobs in Australia. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Lambie. Uh, sorry, Madam President. I just wanted to know um, when this government will be making sure our TAFEs have the equipment and resources required to adequately teach our kids to build submarines. Is there a date or timeline on that? That's all I'm looking for. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I'll just remind the minister of the question that you asked. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you President. And, um, we're doing this right now, Senator Lambie. We have revitalised the TAFE system in this country. Uh, thank it was... you, Minister. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Polly. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister explain how the Housing Australia Future Fund will improve housing outcomes for Australians and make them affordable? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Polly for the question and also acknowledge um, her um, long um, advocacy for um, housing and housing support for um, people doing it tough in Tasmania. Um, the Albanese government wants every Australian to have the security of having a roof over their head. And we know that too many Australians are being hit by growing rents and also those struggling to buy a home. And sadly, there's far too many Australians who are facing homelessness. Part of this situation is brought about, of course, because of the decade of inaction and lack of leadership we had from those opposite when they were in power. But we were elected with a plan to clean up um, the mess that was left behind and deal with some of the country's housing challenges where we can. Fundamental to our plan is increasing the supply of new housing, and the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will be the largest boost to social and affordable housing in a decade. The homes that will be delivered through the fund over the first five years are one part of our ambitious housing agenda, which also includes broadening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, the Housing Accord, the $1.6 billion per annum National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, the, Interna the Interim National Housing Supply and Affordability Council, a new National Housing and Homelessness Plan. We'll also implement the Help to Buy scheme and the Regional First Home Buy Guarantee. I think it is something, again, that will come to this chamber in the next, um, as part of this fortnight, and we are hoping that we can have the support of the whole chamber in making sure that we are supporting the injection of resources and capacity into the social and affordable housing sector. It's important for women fleeing domestic violence. It's important for single women who are at risk of homelessness. It's important for veterans who are facing homelessness. Uh, I think this is a bill that we need to pass through this Senate and hopefully with the support of everybody. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that uh, answer. Can the Minister provide an update on the support demonstrated by those working on the front line with people experiencing housing stress for the Housing Australia Future Fund? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Polly for the supp supplementary. We know that too many people are paying the price for a former government that didn't believe the Commonwealth had a role in addressing the housing needs of all Australians. However, in the Senate last week, housing experts working at the coalface of Australia's housing challenges gave their view of the Housing uh, Australia Future Fund. National Shelter called it the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward in the past 10 years. The City's Future Institute said it's a timely reassertion of national leadership on housing and power housing described it as a transformative reform that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. There was near unanimous support for the bills to pass by um, representatives and stakeholders of this sector and acknowledgement that any delay would greatly impact those Australians who most need the housing that it would provide. I would urge those senators in this place, considering their position on this bill, to listen to the views of those that work in the sector about what needs Thank to you, be Minister. done. Uh, Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, we on this side of the chamber understand the urgency of this fund, but can the minister please explain why it is urgent for the Housing Australia Future Fund to be delivered? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank Senator Polly for the question, the supplementary. So, after no Commonwealth leadership for the last decade, we have taken substantial steps in the last 10 months since forming government to turn the tide. 
When asked if the Senate should act more quickly to support our government's package, the Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent. The Housing Industry Association said we have to put something in place right now, and the Property Council said the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. Every day we hear from stakeholders about the need in the sector and the importance of the passage of these housing reforms to ensure that we are getting resources into the sector. And again, I would urge those, including those opposite, that say no to everything. They say no to wage rises. They say no to the industrial relations reform. They've said no to renewable energy. They say no to help with the power bills. They say no to the safeguard mechanism. They say no to the NRF. They say no to everything. No. Don't say no to the Housing Australia Thank Future Fund. Thank you, Minister. Fund. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Thank you, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Did Labor make an election promise to older Australians that every aged care home would have a registered nurse on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by the 1st of July 2023? Uh, Minister Farrell. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, thank, thank, uh, uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Um, well, I think it's um, there's a certain irony, I suppose, is the word that I would use uh, in the uh, coalition raising the issue of uh, aged care when uh, we saw such. Um, Tragedy, that word, uh, and uh, well, that's the word neglect uh, by the uh, former uh, former government in this uh, in this uh, in this area. Um, under uh, under the Albanese government, we intend to turn things around in the uh, aged care uh, sector. Um, unfortunately, we can't wave a wand and solve all of the problems that we inherited from the former government. Uh, but but. Um, uh, but we're we're working on it, and of course, um, the first thing we're doing, of course, is putting nurses back into nursing homes, uh, and uh, and uh, we're putting dignity and respect uh, back into the centre of uh, of aged care, something that was not done by the uh, previous uh, government. Now, um, residential uh, aged care homes will be required uh, to have a registered nurse on site and on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the 1st of July 2023, in line with the government's uh, election uh, commitment. Um, it's, this, it's in this way that um, uh, neglected uh, older Australians uh, um, um, get the respect that they didn't get, that they didn't get, that they, didn't, that they failed to get uh, under the uh, under the previous uh, government, um, and of course, um, the promise I've just uh, referred to there was a recommendation. Thank you, Minister. Of Your time for answering has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Mm. Um, thank you, yes. <clears throat> thank you, President. Wow. Noting yes. that this was a key election commitment, which you have just reaffirmed, yes. Minister. Mm. Yesterday, the Minister for Aged Care mm. conceded that the government mm. mandated requirements for nursing mm. cannot be delivered. Uh -oh. Oh. Is this a broken promise? Order, order on my right, Minister Farrell. Shame. Um, well, again, I um, thank you, President, and thank Senator Rustin for her, for her question. Um, again, I, um, I'm surprised that this is an area in which the Opposition um, are asking questions. Given given the lack of action uh, and the lack of uh, uh, respect for um, um, the aged care sector in the uh, former uh, for, former government, uh, we committed to implementing uh, a new 24/7 nursing standard in residential aged care in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission. Uh, thank you. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you. On, uh, on relevance, um, Madam President, um, I was actually asking uh, the minister in relation to a comment that was made by the minister yesterday 
in reflecting on his answer to my primary question and just wonder whether the minister would like to correct the fact that he appears to have misled the chamber. You've raised the point of order. The um, <coughs> minister was being rele relevant to the first part of your question. I'll remind him of the second part. Thank you, Minister uh, Farrell, which was in relation to comments the aged care minister made yesterday. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Um, look, I I can understand why um, the opposition is embarrassed uh, that this government is taking action in respect to uh, restoring some dignity. Uh, minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Birmingham. President, in your previous ruling in response to Senator Rustin's point of order. Uh, you indicated the minister had been relevant to the first part of her question, but directed him to the second part of her question. Instead, Senator Farrell has got to his feet and simply begun reflecting upon things that are completely irrelevant to the second part of Senator Rustin's question, which went to statements made by the Minister for Aged Care yesterday. I ask you to draw the minister not just to Senator Rustin's question, but to comply with your ruling, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll remind Senator Farrell of the second part of the question on which I directed him. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President. And um, um, look, the, um, th this is a very thank simple. You, Minister. This... The time for answering has expired. <laughs> Senator Rustin, second supplementary. <clears throat> thank you, President. Minister. Hoping that you understand the workforce challenges that are particularly acute in rural, regional and remote Order. Australia, Order. will you guarantee that no more aged care facilities will close as a result of the actions of your government? Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, uh, thank you uh, President, and thanks uh, Senator Rustin for the, uh, the question. Um, Look, we're, um, we're putting dignity and respect back into the centre of, uh, of the aged care system in Australia. Uh, and as I said uh, in response to your first question, um, we're putting nurses back into nursing homes. We, we want the neglect, we want the neglect of the previous government to end. Um, and uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your right. uh, seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Again, on relevance, my question was very specific about a guarantee that the actions of the government. Senator Polly, just a moment, Senator Rustin. Order on my right. Please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, as I said, on relevance, um, my question was very specific uh, in relation to uh, a guarantee by the government that no nursing homes would close down as a result of actions of this government. I don't believe the minister has gone anywhere near the um, question. Thank you, Senator Rustin. You also talked about workforce challenges, and the minister is being relevant to the question. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President. Um, <clears throat> false and misleading claims that aged care homes will be forced to close are irresponsible and not based on any fact they cause unnecessary alarm, and I'm disappointed in you, uh, Senator Rustin. They cause, they cause unnecessary panic, stress and alarm. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, all, all I, um, uh, President, I just uh, ask you if you may ask the minister if he reflects on the accuracy of his answers. Uh, uh, that's not a point of order, Senator Rustin. Please continue, Senator Farrell. I, I, I am happy to reflect on the accuracy of my uh, uh, answers, and uh, I think they, uh, they, uh, uh, Thank you, they are accurate. The time for answering has expired. So that further questions be put on the notice paper. Thank you. Um, Senator Farrell, is the documents that uh, Senator Birmingham sought to table? Uh, Thank you. That very fine speech by. And senators, I just want to make a statement in relation to um, a review I was asked to undertake yesterday. So, senators, I was asked to review the hands out of the debate of yesterday's first urgency motion. Having done so, I wanted to make two points about the mechanisms that support orderly and respectful debate in the Senate. First, I remind all senators that it is not in order to impute improper motives to other senators. In relation to their reasons for presenting motions or bills to the Senate, 
or in relation to their reasons for supporting or not supporting motions or bills. Having said that, I do not consider that senators are in breach of this rule if they are making the point that a proposal aligns with a particular political view. As President Ryan noted in a statement to the Senate on 14 November 2019, consequences can be attributed to policy or views without ascribing a particular motivation to those with opposing views or priorities. Odgers Australian Senate practice identifies the rationale for the rules of debate. They are designed to ensure that debate is conducted in the privileged forum of parliament without personally offensive language. We all have a role in upholding that standard. May I also remind colleagues to address their remarks to the chair and not directly to other senators. This practice acknowledges the role of the chair in maintaining order and is also intended to guard against any tendency to lapse into unparliamentary language. While the Senate is rightfully a place for robust debate, these rules provide the foundation for that debate to be conducted in a respectful manner. They are particularly important when we are dealing with complex and sensitive topics. I thank the Senate. Senator Cadell. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I rise and seek to uh, take note of answers to all questions by the government to coalition questions. You have the call. Thank you. It's uh, another day, another question time, and here I am again. I was looking for something original to say in my take note, but same old story over and over again. We ask the questions and we get a history review of what happened nine years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. But that's not what the people of Australia are after. They're after what is the vision, what is the hope, what is the optimistic view of what will happen in five years, what will happen in two years. How will their lives be better in one year? How will they meet their mortgage payments, their interest payments, their energy payments? How will they do that in next month? But we don't get that here. We are a long way from getting that here. I noted Minister Farrell was talking about the years and years and years ago of other policy when avoiding saying the number $275, because that's what we are doing. We are avoiding talking about what we can do in this chamber, what this government will do to make the lives better for the people of Australia. And that's a scary bit, because saying something isn't doing something. Saying we will put nurses into nursing homes isn't getting it done. Saying we will drop $275 on your energy bills, isn't doing that. And I like that every time it comes up, we're reminded that we stood in the way or we, we didn't supply the, the gas cap. This is like when your dog is attacking your cat and the answer of someone else is to shoot the dog and you're accused of not supporting the cat. It is a wrong thing to do. Your energy policy is wrong. To cap this thing is wrong. It is, you don't, just by not supporting something doesn't mean you're trying to get the outcome. It is a wrong policy. It is a wrong thing to do in that poor dog. There are people out there, and they are, they are suffering 30 to 50 to 60 per cent energy rises. And that's what's going on. And a gas cap isn't helping them. And they can say what it would have been, what it could have been. You know, I wouldn't be here. I'd be having a lovely week off if I had the lotto numbers last week. But I didn't, and I'm here. But this is what we get every time from this. We get avoidance of what actually happened. We get avoidance of the policies. We get a history vision. It's almost like Minister Farrell is auditioning for a sequel, pitching to Hollywood the inconvenient truth to the avoidance. Well, we can't do that forever. The Australian people need more. We talk about wage growth, and it's talking about how it was a preset policy of the government for wage growth to be low, but it was wage growth. And we note in December, the highest real wage drop on record. 
not in 10 years, not in five years, not in a month. On record, the highest real wage growth was just in December. That is the difference between a government doing things and saying things. And this is a government very good at saying things. It is not a good government that is very good at doing things. And that's where we can come together. There are very good people in this room. There are very good people in the other room. But we are stuck in the hype and the hyperbole of the election promises and of, of beliefs and of philosophies and this that the practical things aren't happening. We have seen that so many times when there are simple practical steps that can make people's lives better, whether we can be talking about it and we're not talking about it. We talk about the irony of what happened over the last, let's even go back three years, where we had COVID, where we had these things. There was failures in, in aged care. Let's, we can own that. It was acceptable. It was never put under such pressure as what we had. What we are looking for is a way forward. Every time I stand up to take note, that is why we all came here. We didn't come here to hurl abuse across the chamber, Mr Acting President, or Mr Deputy President, sorry. It's a bit of fun. We have a bit of theatre for an hour. But it's not why we came here. We came here to try and improve the lots for people in our electorates, in our regions, in our states, in our families, around our, around our people who care to us and we know. And that isn't done by not taking responsibility. And so we always stand here, we always hear, ask the questions, we never get the answers, but the sad thing is the Australian people don't get the answers. They don't get the answers to what this government is going to do so that they can pay their mortgage, with interest rates going up nine times since this government was elected. Not all their fault, not saying it's their fault. We don't have to apportion blame, we have to create hope. And we aren't doing that, and we need to do things better. We aren't seeing how we're creating enough energy to put downward prices on energy prices, downward forces on energy prices. That is the things we need to do. That is the things we should be doing, and I look forward to this government realising that and doing more. Senator Krogan. Um, Senator Cadell, I agree with so much of what you said. Um, there are some great people in here, and we really should be working together to get the kind of outcomes that the Australian people deserve. It's very sad that you're leaving the chamber, though. Um, and we have laid out a vision. We have laid out a vision for one year, for five years, for 10 years, in many of those areas that have been traversed across throughout this question time. History is important because we look back on history to try not to do the things that did not work again and to do more of the things that did work, to learn from that experience. And when we are faced with accusations that we've you know, killed the housing sector. I have to tell you that you cannot kill the housing sector in 10 short months. It's actually not possible. It's just not possible. The kind of neglect that you have to have to end up where we are now started long before 10 months. So, Senator Cadell, I will just remind you that a lot of that history piece is about understanding what's moving forward. But what we did see today was a definite theme, definite theme of across the chamber just saying no. No to every issue that was brought up. No to wage increases as we've gone along. In fact, a deliberate policy to stagnate them. And, and, and that was an admitted intent while those opposite were in government. No to action on climate change. And in this chamber, you're not alone. There are those on our crossbenches and in the Greens who have done the same, have chosen not to take action to move this country forward, to deal with one of the biggest global crises we've ever seen, to protect the future for our children and our society. We must make change. But no, no is the answer. And specifically, no to the safeguards mechanism. And that is just bizarre. It is a structure that in 2015 you were fully behind. Now, you put it in place in such a way that it actually achieved nothing, 
um, and in fact um, could be held responsible for increasing emissions by letting people off the hook on their emissions. But it is the same theory that you spouted at that time but then failed to deliver on because you did not structure the mechanism sufficiently. Now what we have done is taken that in a bipartisan way and made it stronger, strengthened it so that it will actually achieve those outcomes, that it will actually reduce emissions, so that it will actually get us to our targets and help us save the future effectively. We've heard a lot in this chamber in the last couple of hours about the IPCC report. And yes, it is alarming. This is a global alarming crisis. And it is about time that we did something about it. But no, that's the word we hear most. No, 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 and a bit more no. So you said no to 230 average savings to household power bills. Those opposites said no to changing the law. Uh, sorry, said, said, said no to so many different measures over and over again, leaving us in the situation we're in now, where we do not have sufficient action. This constant rewriting of history the sense that in, in the nine plus years that you were in government that you didn't actually contribute to any of the challenges that we are now facing. So when you say that the questions through question time are not being answered by the Labor government, I can assure you they are. The problem is you don't like the answer, but that does not mean that the answer was not given. So. I will just wrap up by saying that we must work together at some degree to get change, to make this country better. There is a point where you have to put aside the rubbish and actually get on board with progressive change. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Uh, the motion before you, Deputy President, is to take note of the answers given by coalition senators. Uh, but what we've seen today is, a, 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 sadly, a, a, a display of not answering questions that are before uh, those on the other side. And uh, I don't know if uh, maybe those up in the gallery aren't aware, but today is broadcast day. That little light up there uh, is broadcasting from the Senate uh, to radios uh, right across the country and online. And uh, people, instead of they're tuning in and, and listening to question time today, they, they had the opportunity to hear some answers to questions that were asked by uh, well-meaning uh, coalition senators. And, and what we got was just non-answers, uh, avoiding answering questions. You know, there were questions about what will the government do, and they just reflected on what the previous government did. Uh, there were questions to the heart of uh, very serious issues across this country, uh, the cost of living. Uh, there, were, there were promises that were made before the election that people would see a reduction in their electricity bills. We heard it 90 odd times throughout the election campaign from the government that, that, the, that, that Australians would see their electricity bills reduced by $275 if, uh, if, this, uh, if, if this government was elected. And they've walked away from that. They've broken the promise on, on that commitment that they made. Uh, and and that's, that's why you're hearing non-answers on this side, because they don't want to admit the fact that they, they, they actually told the Australian people a big fat lie, because they wouldn't be able to actually deliver on it. And they've done nothing to actually address cost of living. That one of the best ways that they could address cost of living is actually to reduce spending. But we've seen no measure whatsoever from this government to actually uh, cut the, the expenditure of government, because that is uh, the surefire way of reducing inflation. That is the surefire way of addressing cost of living issues 
for Australian households. Instead, all this government is doing is leaving it up to the RBA to uh, increase interest rates, to ultimately restrict the availability of, of, of people's uh, availability of cash to be able to fund their, their, their expenses uh, because it's hitting people's mortgages. So it's the mortgagees of this country that are making the big decisions instead of this government. And it's a real shame because there are some very, very serious issues that this government is contending with and they're, they're actually walking away rather than facing up to the issues that are before us. We heard questions today about uh, what, what this government was going to do in relation to the promise that they made that there will be 24-hour, uh, seven days a week coverage of re re um, registered nurses in, in our aged care homes. And we heard a question, a very serious question, was asked to Senator Farrell about uh, whether or not uh, the, 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 the words from the minister uh, that's responsible for aged care uh, made yesterday about the, uh, what it seemed to be walking back from that commitment that was made. Uh, a question was asked of Senator Farrell as to whether or not uh, he stands by that question, whether or not maybe, maybe the minister misspoke, maybe the minister didn't quite get it right. But instead of facing up to the scrutiny of that question, the minister just avoided it completely. And so what we've seen on broadcast day for the Senate is a, is a show, is a demonstration of how to not answer questions. And this government is proving quite effectively to be very artful in breaking promises and very artful in dodging questions. And the Australian people expect more. The Australian people deserve more from this government. But you're proving time and again to be quite adept at dodging questions, at breaking promises. And it's having a real impact on Australian people. It's affecting them. Because while you're doing that, you're not facing up to it and you're not actually putting in place measures that might actually help people. Because we've got a cost of living crisis in this country and by your arrogance in coming in here and not answering the, the, the scrutiny of questions here in this place, you're actually saying to the Australian people that all you're interested in is power all you're interested in is just getting into on that side of the chamber and not actually taking your job seriously. So take your job seriously, Labor. Uh, Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I kind of enjoyed Senator Cadell's contribution before, but found it a little bit confusing. Um, and I'm Anyway, I've had a cat and a dog before, and I don't remember uh, those sorts of issues being raised. I'm not sure if we need to check on the welfare of Senator Cadell's dog or cat, but anyway, interesting, um, interesting metaphors used. But uh, Senator Cadell also suggested in his contribution that if Senator Parrell was uh, pitching a, a film to Hollywood, it would be called The Avoidance. Um, just like to reflect, if, if that's their view of uh, Senator Farrell's contribution to Question Time, then perhaps uh, their questions would be pitched as a film called The Irony. Maybe the irony or um, the audacity might be another good one um, if we're going to be, be naming these contributions as filmed. I mean, aged care, come on, that last question. Like the Royal Commission report into aged care, which came down under the previous government, was literally called neglect. Like it does not get, uh, it does not get clearer than that. And the failures under the previous government, under aged care, were blindingly obvious for all of us to see. I won't repeat some of the horrific details which came out of aged care homes during that time, but I think everyone in this country could agree that the aged care sector was in absolute crisis. And that's why we came to the election with an ambitious plan to fix it, because frankly, it deserved nothing less. You can't receive a report, or we, as Labor people, can't read a report called neglect and not seek to respond to it without the utmost ambition. 24-7 nurses in nursing homes is a high ambition. And you know what? We're 80 per cent of the way there. 9 per cent of services are close. And we are hopeful that we will get all the way there. But it is likely there'll be exemptions for some because workforce is a serious, serious challenge. 
It's a real challenge. It's a challenge which didn't start 10 months ago. It's a challenge which started 10 years ago under the previous government. We've been in government 10 months. They were in government for almost a decade. So the workforce challenges are serious. They won't be fixed overnight. But what we have done is supported a wage increase for aged care workers. Not only supported it and backed it in, but are paying for it. Are paying for it. Because this sector and the workers within it have not felt valued, and it's very hard to attract workers to a sector where they don't feel valued and where they're not paid appropriately for the work they do. So that's part of fixing the workforce challenge. And I don't make any apologies for having high ambition in this space. And frankly, if you have anything short of high ambition in aged care, I mean, honestly, so, Phil, there you go, Senator Cadell. The audacity, the irony, you choose. And not just on aged care today. I mean, then we got to, to energy prices, to climate change. I mean, 22 failed energy policies over the term of their government. If you're serious about taking action on energy prices, if you're serious about supporting the investment in renewables and other forms of power which would help alleviate pressure on electricity, alleviate pressure on energy, you would have pulled the show together and delivered an energy policy that could stick. We've had a decade of inaction and disunity on climate change and energy policy in this country, and we're staring down the barrel of more because you're not coming to the table on safeguards. These guys aren't coming to the table on safeguards, as it seems. I mean, if we want another decade of failed energy and climate policy, that's what you do. The audacity and the irony, the audacity and the irony, and on wages more broadly. There could not be a clearer indication in the difference of, of values of our government and the opposition than wages, and the sheer fact that low wages were a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture, and we wanted to see wages increase. It speaks for itself. Actually, it speaks volumes about the values of the, of the modern-day Liberal Party and the values of the Labor movement. We came in and we backed an increase to the minimum wage. We supported increases for aged care workers to get that sector back on track. Being a government of high ambition, of strong values, consistent values, being a government that gives a damn is not something I will ever apologise for the irony and the audacity of the questions today. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's, it's you know, always the same from those office, opposite. It's all bluster. It's all bluff. It's all looking backwards and pointing the finger, not quite realising that they're in government, uh, that they're more interested in virtue signalling than they are in actually delivering any plans to the Australian people and those Australian families who are doing it so tough at the moment. And I guess today what we've seen in the New South Wales state campaign is just another example where the much lauded electric bus that was uh, developed in Western Sydney, but the much lauded electric bus that was going to be taking the Labor uh, wannabe Premier and his team and the media and staff around Sydney to campaign uh, has broken down. The bus that is supposed to have a 300 kilometre radius uh, travelled 60 k's and then broke down. So in what is, you want to talk about irony, then a diesel bus had to come out and pick everybody up. And so we know, we know that those opposite, and their safeguard mechanism, the safeguard mechanism. I mean, I, I know this is take note, and we're here to take note of answers. And, and Senator Farrell, I say this with much love and affection, the ums, the ahs, the bluff, the bluster, the prevarication is really quite something to behold. It is an Academy Award winning performance of not answering a question. It is absolutely something that, you know, I think actually some of your colleagues have taken on because I've listened to a couple of the speeches today that uh, your colleagues have made in response and no wonder the galleries have emptied. I have never heard a bigger load of rot, of people saying nothing, of addressing nothing and of not putting forward an idea to the Australian public. All the Labor Party is capable of doing is putting forward broken promises, and the Australian electorate is starting to wake up to that. But I guess the bus is just a great example of a broken down opposition at the New South Wales uh, state, 
uh, as they approach their election this weekend, and the broken down bus, the electric bus that didn't go anywhere, a reflection of those opposite and the plans they put forward or the policies they put forward before the election to the broken promises and the litany of lies that have been told to the electorate since then. We know that we went into this election with the Voldemort number of 275, the number that shall not speak its name if you are a member of the ALP. 97 times the Australian people were told that their power bills would come down by $275. Well, we all know that is now a furphy. We were told that there would be no changes to superannuation, not modest changes, not tinkering around the edges, no changes to superannuation. We were told that there'd be no changes to franking credits. We weren't going to make the mistake of, of Minister Bowen, uh, as he did in the 2019 election, that if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. Very sound advice that the Australian electorate took up. So they, they learned from that mistake, so they lied to the Australian people about franking credits, because now we're looking at you can't pay a dividend once capital raising's occurred. We've got farmers absolutely petrified because these modest changes means that family farms that have passed from generation to generation that are part of uh, self-managed super funds, we know that they're now under threat because of this absolutely economically reckless and ridiculous unrealised asset being taxed. And for those that are you know, watching on the broadcast, by taxing an unrealised asset, that means something that's not sold. It's, it's actually a paper profit. And so if you own land that you've worked hard and invested in and saved for your family, and it somehow tips over $3 million on paper, hasn't been sold, you don't have any money in the bank, hasn't been sold, it's just in the paper, on paper, you will have to sell that to pay the tax bill, the grab from those opposite who hate retirees, who hate farmers, and absolutely have their hearts set on destroying the self-managed super funds because their union mates make up the bulk of the big super funds. And of course, the biggest issue, though, facing Australians is cost of living pressures. Now, energy promise was broken. There's no 275 reduction. In fact, from July 1 this year, we're going to see a further 20 per cent increase on gas and electricity bills. We know there's going to be gas shortages, which is going to put further pressure. And whenever you do market interventions around price caps, what you do is you actually make it worse in the long run. And that's what we've seen from this government. They have no plan. But what they have is lots of absolutely unfounded and ridiculous rhetoric pointing back to the previous government. The word COVID never passes their lips, apparently. And as I've said this, according to Senator Polly, we had calm economic waters because COVID was calm. This is an insult to every Australian family, and your rhetoric isn't making one iota of difference to a family budget. I put the question, those the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, um, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's woeful response to my questions about racism and racial justice. We are not a post-racist utopia. The climate crisis is a racial justice issue. Those who contributed least to the crisis, this is black and brown people in the global south, are and will experience the worst of it, from the floods in Pakistan to the drought in the Horn of Africa and water lapping at the door of our neighbours in the Pacific Islands. They are living through untold suffering. Australia's insatiable appetite to dig up, to burn and to ship out fossil fuels is turbocharging climate change for the most vulnerable communities across the globe. The relentless pursuit of profit and power by wealthy colonial countries and multinational corporations has put the world on track for a global climate catastrophe. And yet, this injustice is completely neglected and denied in the climate change discourse in this country. Yet, rather than stand up to coal and gas lobbies, Labour capitulates and will allow them to buy their way out of their climate obligations with unfettered, cheap and dodgy offsets. Today, the world's climate scientists gave us a terrifying final warning. The message from the IPCC, from the UN, from scientists and other experts globally is clear. Stop opening up new coal and gas. This is the only way to stop dangerous climate change. The IPCC report makes clear that a livable future means no new fossil fuels. If we don't, we risk a global catastrophe that we cannot undo. The UN Secretary General is telling us our world needs climate action on all fronts everything, everywhere, all at once. 
Yesterday, over 50 Australian environmental and climate organizations called on the federal government to listen to evidence from the world scientists and end new coal and gas developments in Australia. It follows a similar open letter signed by over 100 Australian scientists and experts just a few weeks ago. New research by the Australia Institute tells us that pollution from the 116 new fossil fuel projects in the federal government's major projects list would add 4.8 billion tonnes of emissions to the atmosphere by 2030. Despite all this, Labor's plan for climate action, their safeguard mechanism, safeguards coal and gas profits, not the climate, not the people, not the planet. This is not climate action, this is mere greenwashing. Without ending new coal and gas, this is just smoke and mirrors. The public gave us a clear mandate at last year's election. They want us to take serious, effective action on climate change. In this progressive parliament with the Greens, Labour has the numbers for a strong climate policy that delivers deep and rapid greenhouse gas emissions cuts. We can change course right now. Scientists and future generations are begging us to do, to do this. This is what climate justice, social justice, and racial justice demands. Prime Minister Albanese must listen to the science and reject the fossil fuel industry's desperate attempts to keep its business model alive at the expense of people and the planet. Prime Minister Albanese, show some gumption. Take some responsibility. End new coal and gas. I put the question, those questions say aye against no, the ayes have it.